Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Hello, welcome to Asia Tech Podcast Stories. We're all about the stories that make the Asian tech ecosystem so exciting, so dynamic. Today, here in the ATP studio to share his story. Well, this is going to be really interesting, folks. We've got an ex-Googler who left Google to sell flowers. So that in itself is a story to tell, but we've already spoken. I mean, the last time myself and my next guest here, Steve Finer, spoke was a year ago. A lot has happened since then, so I'm really keen to get an update on what the latest is with Steve. But before we start, Steve, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. I, I'm, I'm really excited to, to be back. It's a lot has happened in the past year. It's been an incredible journey. Right. So just put people into context. We'll talk about a better florist in a minute. How long have you been at this? So not too much over a year. So it's closing in on about 20, maybe 22 months. 22 months, right. It's been a, a, an amazing journey, a roller coaster ride as well. We're going to talk all about that. Background to this, you were at Google previously, one of the best jobs yep. in the world, obviously. You then decide at some point in your life to go and do your own thing. There's a story behind this, isn't it? Why you chose flowers. I know you, you told me before, but for the benefit of the listeners who haven't heard about you or this story, please share with us what was the genesis of A Better Florist? <laughs> of course. Um, doesn't everybody just want to quit Google to start a flower company? I mean... <laughs> well, that's the question in our heads straight away, right? Of course, of course. So I did this for two main reasons. The first of which was before I worked at Google, I was a boyfriend. Um, I I had a girlfriend I cared about and I wanted to do something nice for her. And I went online and tried to find something that I knew she'd like. And effectively, I paid 80 something dollars to piss off my own girlfriend. So when the flowers didn't get there, they got there the day after her birthday. It was a whole big catastrophe. Um, and I knew this market needed to change. And I, I knew because it was my own problem. The The second reason was before I left Google, I, I was lucky enough to be given a sabbatical. and I spent three months living in Colombia in one of the cities that's one of the flower capitals of the world. So every single day you're in a coffee shop thinking about your life and thinking about what you love to do. And every single day you wake up and, oh, there's some flowers around you. Mm. So it imprints the idea into your head and the rest is sort of history. Why was it? What, what did you do to piss your girlfriend off? What happened there? <laughs> uh, well, I, I don't fully take blame for this. I, I, <laughs> uh, it wasn't intentional. That's what you're saying. It, right? okay, it so. genuinely was not intentional. Okay, so how did so, your girlfriend get pissed off then? Yeah, so it, it was her birthday. We, I, I was in a long-distance relationship. She wasn't in the same city as me. And I tried to send her flowers. The flowers didn't get there on her birthday, so she thought I didn't send her anything for her birthday, right. um, which she was right. I, I didn't send her anything on her birthday because the company I trusted to do this didn't do their job. And when she did get something, what got sent was just, uh, suffice it to say, quite frustrating. Wow. So you just have this incredible experience, and you're, you're spending money to see somebody smile, and you're, you're trying to do something thoughtful. Like if, if, if it was just about the reaction, like I'd send like a joke or a text message mm -hmm. or whatever, but I wanted to send a physical gift because I, I genuinely cared about that smile. And what I, what I got from that experience was the exact opposite result, a pissed off girlfriend. Um, yeah. so well, you, you're, uh, you're based in Singapore now. Was this when you were in the U S I mean, where did this yeah, happen? The, this was based in the U S right. So I was living in San Francisco at the time. It's amazing, isn't it? When you have that kind of experience, I mean, you know, we've all sent flowers and, I imagine it's just a numbers game when you deal with these massive international flower companies that some of them are going to go uh, amiss or are going to go get waylaid or delayed, that kind of thing. It just seems to be part of their, their business, right? And when you go back to them and say, hey, look, it didn't get delivered or, you know, you, you phone up your mom or your girlfriend and you say, did you get the flowers? Because you're wondering why they haven't texted you that day. It's towards the end of the day. No, I didn't get any flowers. What are you talking about? You go back to the company. Their resolution is they just give you them a refund, right? But as you right. said, it's kind of that can never replace that the the anti smile that you've created, the anti happiness that they've this happened in that day, right? Because you can't undo all those feelings by simply getting a refund, can you? Absolutely. So let's talk about why you then decided to put that right. What was the the idea behind all of that when you sure. could have simply 
built an app being a Google guy, right? Why did you go into into the analog space and deal with flowers? I mean, th these are a product which have a shelf life. You know, they're not easy to transport. You're, you're picking one of the hardest products. Apart from like food delivery, you're picking a pretty tough category to get into, right? Ah, uh, sure. At, at the end of the day, the challenge is what makes it fun. But uh, as we were talking about previously, you, you have these big folks where you're just a number and sometimes the stuff sort of happens. But let, let's just sort of unpack that issue just, just a little bit. So globally, you have like Interflora, 1-800-Flowers, FDD. You have these billion-dollar companies. And these billion-dollar companies don't deliver flowers to Singapore or Tokyo or Taiwan or Dubai. They rely on a network of other florists to do the job for them. And that network of florists, ultimately, they have their own customers. They're an Interflora florist, but they're also Steve's florist. And if Interflora is going to pay them 40 cents on the dollar of what they can get for if the customer went direct, well, who's going to get the fresh rose? Who's going to get the better service? So you have to get your, you have to roll up your sleeves and get your, your hands dirty if you really want to fix the root of the problem. So that's, that's ultimately what we wanted to do. We wanted to vertically integrate so we could do away with some of these calamities and ultimately take responsibility. Hmm. So let us understand the market a little bit. The, you talked about Interflora, Teleflora, 1-800-Flowers, and so on. These are the big guys who are multinational. The way they work now is effectively they outsource that whole process to Steve Flowers on the high street, right? Is that how it works? And they don't have their own distribution centers? No. No. For, for the most part, they just rely on insert local florist. Right. And the insert local florist, they're, they're not they're lovely people that have been career florists that just love flowers. But um, with these big guys taking an increasing share of their profits, they're just getting squeezed. So what are these guys to do? Um, ultimately, what's left is a product that eventually gets delivered, but it's neither satisfying for you or for them or for anyone. Um, and you have these large businesses that are just making a decent amount of money on this. And I, I just viewed this as really an atrocity, and I thought we could we could fix this and deliver a product that made it better for the consumer, made it better for um, the, the companies, and hopefully did right by everybody in the process. Why didn't you just go and set up Steve's florist on the high street? I mean, if you're talking about putting smiles on people's faces, that would have been fantastic, wouldn't it? You would have regular customers walking in every day. That would have made you happy, no? Why, why did you not do that why did you then decide that you wanted to do it on a different kind of level a different scale sure i i'm not against like I, in the very beginning i it was this was in my apartment i i was steve's florist on high street it was there was no scale there is no scale hmm. if you do it right in the small things and for the record like we've had so many screw-ups and we've had so many ups and definitively downs but we don't get to, to scale on day one. So genuinely, we, we did start at the, those sort of low levels. But um, ultimately, we, we did this to have a real impact. And um, if I am only able to service the people for the block around me or the three blocks or the, the mile or kilometer around me, then that's just not that many people. That doesn't scale too tremendously. So we wanted to do this to have a pretty large impact on as many people as we can possibly reach. 100 smiles a day becomes 1,000 smiles a day becomes 10,000 smiles a day mm -hmm. and on and on and on it goes. So you have to scale if you want to be able to to have the impact that, that I think we really should and we, we really want to create. Mm. How do you measure that impact, Steve? What is, I mean, obviously there are the numbers. Is there anything beyond the numbers which you can measure the impact you're having on people's lives? So I, I, I find myself being a fairly quantitative individual. Like my, my dad's a, an accountant. My father's a statistician. But like, so of course there are the numbers, but genuinely it, it's the anecdotal stories. It's the moments that matter. Um, so one thing that, that we set up on our team is, and we, we've stolen it from Steve Wynn, who is just mm. an incredible leader, um, is just tell me a story. Tell me a story about how you went the extra mile. So one of our, one of our couriers, Joanne, she sang to a special needs child on her birthday. Nobody asked her to do it, but like the look on that child's face was priceless. 
mm. that that is the impact that we had. Or um, one of our couriers, Patrick, found out this woman wasn't home. Oh, where is she? Oh, it turns out she's in the hair salon. So we went into the hair salon and like gave her the bouquet wow. in the middle of like her hair appointment. That was and, like, awesome. Genuinely, yeah, it's like that is the impact. Yeah. Um, all the numbers will eventually be what they are and what they deserve to be, but it, it's the stories and those magic moments. That right. is, yeah, I mean, the stories and the numbers can't be separated. The stories really are the, the human angle on those numbers, aren't they? How do you... This is a challenge. I'm always curious about this. I and mean, you mentioned Steve Wynn, you know, obviously is a fantastic example. I'm curious how you institutionalize that if that's the right word i don't know if there's a better word for it but you know as you grow how do you make it such that those stories and the become part of the organization and you know you have the right people to do that because this is key isn't it when you're not recruiting the delivery driver because you know when you're starting out you're doing everything when you're not doing that personally how do you make that happen when you're you know a team of a thousand people have you thought about that challenge? Yes, yes, yeah. I have. Um, <laughs> the answer I have to that is pretty disappointing. I, I genuinely don't have a very good answer. Mm. It's 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 quite a challenge, and to be honest, I, I think the vast majority of businesses will ultimately face this challenge and struggle with it. I I think we're lucky enough where we don't have too much of a scale where. A lot of the things I can be involved or our, our wonderful team can be involved in with the core nucleus of our team. I, I think it, it's a great, strong team. So I, I think for the immediate future, we should be okay. But going forward, absolutely, we, we will tackle this. And the only thing I can say is as long as we have a very core sense of belief and structure and culture, and ultimately we are doing this for this reason and we are prioritizing that smile over that dollar, um, that's, that's the only thing that we can do, but, um, I, if anybody solves this, please let me know. <laughs> I mean, it's fascinating the way that you've answered that because I think that's refreshing in a way and it is completely the right way to approach the, the challenge, isn't it? Is that you, you don't necessarily have to have the answer. It's not, not a challenge right now, but you'll deal with it when you come to it. And in a way, it reminds me having read. Tony Shea's work as well. Is yeah, that delivering it? happiness. Yeah. Exactly. That how much, you know, they didn't start out saying that, you know, they were going to do it like that. It's just that was the core nucleus of the team and, and the culture that they built. It's only later on did they actually say, okay, there's a, there's a sort of philosophy here in an architecture which we can kind of make sense of all of this, right? So, you know, if you're just focused on let's go out and give the best possible experience and be the best possible people and deliver happiness, that's cool. How do you actually institutionalize that? Well, that comes later on, doesn't it? That comes sort of when you have a team big enough, then that you have somebody focusing on that and so on, right? Right. Oh, you mentioned Steve Wynn. Is, is, have you taken anything from him in terms of his lessons and sort of growing his business, and, you know, in terms of what you're doing? Are there any sort of parallels that you see there? Uh, parallels would be putting it generously for me. Um, Steve Wynn's Steve Wynn's just awesome. I like consume his content like crazy. All of his speeches are just incredible. The man has just a passion and a fervor that is just off the charts. Uh, I, I was lucky enough to meet him earlier this year. Mm -hmm. um, like the, that was just a pretty sensational experience. And um, I, I just take away the like he's he's not the youngest guy in the world. But when you talk to him, when you see him, when you hear him speak. You just know he will go the extra mile and he will go as far as it takes and do whatever it takes. And his thing is service. His thing is creating this experience. So he will genuinely just make sure that experience does whatever it takes to be incredible, sensational. Um, so I, I, I just take all of that from him. I, I find him just be an incredible role model, just a wonderful person to learn from. Yeah. I, and the business, like we talked about the numbers as well. I mean, it just follows, doesn't it? What he's achieved and his business right just through that how, how do you actually this is what what you know i think is fascinating is everybody says that they want to create a great service you know they want to create a great experience now right but for somebody like him and what you're doing is there any things that you actually consciously do and you've kind of learned because you've been in the game now for just under two years is that you've learned that actually that creates it's these small touches creating an amazing experience what kind of things have you learned 
in your time doing this, which you didn't know at the beginning, when it comes specifically to the service and experience side of things? So in my head, there are two different ways to answer this. The first of which is probably the more honest answer, which is now an additional year in, I probably have more questions than I had a year ago, not mm. more answers. I, I think my self-awareness has increased and ultimately I realize how little I know and how poor I am in such a variety of topics. So if I am below average or 10, the 10th percentile in anything, I know to ask for help. I know to figure out and hopefully locate an answer. Um, so I, I think that is one of the biggest sort of lessons, learnings, things that needed to happen. Um, that impacts customer service, that impacts service in general, and it impacts just everything. Um, to, to answer it from, from the other side, so from a more tactical perspective, I, 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 think, I think the main lesson here is to have both a number approach and then a non-numbered approach. Like operations is one of those things where you really do need to have pulse, pulse checks on your business daily. And depending on what your business is, like the key metrics are maybe net promoter score, on-time delivery, um, fill rate, return rate, whatever it is. Um, and all those things will matter. And if you um, optimize towards those numbers, fabulous. But it's the people that are running these numbers. So if you don't spend enough time optimizing for the people that are running these numbers, well, like they're, they're, all the optimization for the numbers themselves, yeah. it, it, it will eventually break. So I, I, I think the, the best thing I can say is have a, a strong focus on both quantitative measures and like qualitative measures as well like there's a strong amount of emotional intelligence that needs to be done with all of this um, and it's it's really just the people in the front line that makes all of this possible so figuring out the right sort of incentive structure and the right sort of compassion to make sure that they want to execute and do an amazing job mm. now, how many people are you now steve it's low 20s it's, it's nothing too crazy right right and have you been active hands-on active in selecting those people yeah yeah i have okay so uh, i mean the point i want to get to is you talk about the people at the front line they are your brand effectively you talk about net promoter score on time delivery and you're so right it's, no matter how strong your organization is when it comes to the numbers or operations at the end of the day it's whether or not the people are the right people for that so how are you going about getting the right people into your business because i imagine everybody wants to work for an ex google guy because he knows what he's doing right so that's going to be easy enough for you to recruit people how do you make sure you get the right people to make this business fly you don't you, you don't know anything or i don't know anything um and like the irony of like sure you want to work for the ex google guy because he's smart in reality he's not like <laughs> you're too humble 28 no nah, like I, I i think I, I genuinely think the things that I don't know are just so much more than the things I do know. And every single day that passes, there are just so many more things I realize that I just do not know. Um, hiring is genuinely one of those areas. And mm. I, my mom actually has like helped me a decent chunk in terms of systematic processes to hiring. So the, I, 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 I've tried to learn from, from my mom in this regard. And I, I've also actually tried to pull some of the best practices from Google. So four main interviews, everybody is rated on a certain scale based on these criteria. We're asking these questions to assess these sort of things. But I, I think we've made some genuine mistakes, and I think right. we'll continue to make some genuine mistakes because hiring is hard and recruiting really good talent is it's hard. Right. Well, you know, I, I see, especially in a business like yours, the recruitment really is your marketing strategy, isn't it? I mean, people see – I mean, go back to Tony Shea as an example how much – effort they put into recruitment and how that impacts their brand in the long term and hr i suppose as a function is always seen as a you know a cost center in any business but ultimately now these days it really is the marketing the key the core the dna of the marketing so you say for example that you started out you've made mistakes in recruitment what do you know now about team building that you didn't know when you started out that things that you've changed from mistakes made along the way so like your memory is not accurate like mm. the way in which you remember things is completely subjective 
and your brain will literally misremember certain things. There have been a number of like scientific studies on this. So like you might you might emotionally feel somebody is like a great candidate. You feel super like cool around them. But in reality, like unless you were systematically breaking it down into, oh, they are answering it this way. And this is this suggests this hmm. versus, oh, I love this dude. This dude's great. Right. Like it, it, if you if you opine at the this dude is great level versus the this guy has great problem solving, a bit stubborn um analytical work could use some skills here um, and clearly like no leadership. Um, if, if you opine at that level, that is a lot more useful than like great guy, hmm. like the, the great guy stuff, like just please throw it out. But like, like even in consulting, even in Google, like all the interviews really were just like, Oh, you love football. I love football. Fantastic. Like, right, but like how, how do you, how do you temper that? Because it's always, you know, the challenge is, is that we make decisions on emotion and justify with logic, don't we? So, uh, yeah, he's a great guy. We both love the same football team. And then you end up justifying all the logical stuff to shoehorn that into fit, right? It doesn't matter about his leadership because, you know, he's learning. And how do you structure that in a way such that you don't allow that, hey, he's a great guy decision to override all the other kind of detail which you're talking about when you're building your team? Honestly, like, I, I don't really know the answer. I, I know how we're kind of trying to solve it. Um, and the way we're kind of trying to solve it is just by diving deeper and deeper and deeper and trying to ask more probing and probing and probing questions of ourselves. Mm -hmm. So anyone who interviews this person, great. Why do you say that? Great. What demonstrates that? Okay. How do we further assess this? What are the gaps we have with this candidate? Why do we feel that way? And like, don't get me wrong, like the human side of this fundamentally is important. We all really want to work with people that we want to work with. We all want to get out of the bed and like, like be around people that are great to be around. So it, like this stuff does have a use, but it, it's probably mainly 20, maybe 25% of the equation as opposed to 75, 80% of the equation. So we just need to weight it accordingly and probe and dive and dig and to find, is it, is, is it being weighted effectively? And I, I think if we continue to ask those questions of each other, we'll, we'll hopefully continue to get to a better answer. Yeah. I mean, go, you mentioned the, the, the story of your delivery driver, the lady who went to the, the lawn, not the laundry, to the hairdresser, the salon. Yeah, to the hairdresser. Right. Yeah. So with an example like that, I mean, everybody wants that kind of experience. I know you talk about delivering happiness. You talk about putting smiles on people's faces. That, that is, you know, that is the story that people are going to share. You shared it with me. I mean, it, you know, going back to people like Steve Wynn or people like Tony Shea, you know, we all have heard the stories about how there's brands have touched people's lives in those, what seems to be unstructured ways. So how do you look for that in somebody when they're applying to a company like yours, is there a sort of a telltale sign that they will be somebody like that? Cause that's gold. Not, not I mean, really. Can, no, no. It's, right. Yeah. <laughs> so there's no way that you could know that person's going to turn out to be like that. No, honestly. And especially with drivers, a lot of the learning is retroactive and not necessarily proactive. So you can look for like extroversion, introversion. You can see punctuality. You can see attention to detail. Um, like some of those things are leading indicators, but in reality, like I, I don't think we have a very predictive model. I, I think if if we looked at this from a purely quantitative factor, like I, I think we can explain maybe half of what's going on, but like half of these these things were, were it's just lock invariance. Mm -hmm. So like I we we've focused on all of these we've put in all this energy and effort into something to maybe solve half of the equation, which sounds almost disappointing in the end but even half is a lot better than like zero right so. you've reduced the risk of making the decision haven't you rather than identifying what the ideal decision is right you've basically said well less chance of this pe person being like this so you know they're, they're weighted strongly on that sense but you, you can never find the ideal candidate in that sense you, i suppose you've just got to do, do you give people a run out let them tr try them in the business see how they go for a few weeks, few months. I mean, how does it work with you in terms of like bringing new talent on board? Because as you say, you don't have a predictive model. Right. How, how does that work with you? 
Yeah, exactly the way you just described. So having some sort of on the job, like this is the job, do you like the job type of mentality works probably better than almost anything else. Mm. Like it, it, it doesn't work all the time. And the reason it doesn't work all the time is because some people uproot their entire lives and come move to Singapore for you. And like they, they're not going to come work and move to Singapore for like a two week gig. Like that's not necessarily fair to them, but that does solve, I'd say 80% of the problems here or solve a lot of the problems here. Right. Yeah. It's fast. I mean, it's fascinating listening to your story, Steve, because you seem remarkably humble for somebody who, well, you worked for Google. I'm not saying that carries any kind of character connotation, but you could easily be in a situation where you profess to know it all and going into a startup world as well. You know, you could be in a situation where, you know, I, I've seen this, I've done this before, you know, I worked for Google. I'm just curious how, how you, sort of, you know, you come across so humble. Have you always been like that? Is, is this a conscious thing for you that you're aware of your limitations in that respect? How do you go about that on a daily basis? Honestly, I don't notice it. So the vast majority of people around me are smarter than me. Like, like I, I try to surround myself with people who, and like they're not smarter than me because I'm so intelligent. They're even more like they're smarter than me because they're just smart people. Hmm. Um, like, I, I just in my version of the world, we all try to like find people that we enjoy and like to be around. Um, and in my version of the world, I, I tend to be around some like wonderful folks who. Some of them are brilliant. Some of them are wonderful. Some of them are interesting, whatever. Um, ultimately, in having conversations with these folks, you realize that <laughs> I don't know what the hell I'm doing. Um, you also realize that they don't know what the hell they're doing either. Um, and most people really don't know what the hell they're doing. Uh, it, confidence is, like, I, I, I'm for the most part quite confident. Mm. But in reality, like confidence can be shown. Confidence can be faked. It, I, I genuinely believe it, it takes a level of confidence to say, I don't know. Um, like, how do we solve this versus like, you're not going to get anywhere if you just like proclaim to know everything. Like that, that's not how you solve the problem. It's not how you solve any problem. Right. I mean, there's different kinds of confidences, as you said. Do you see yourself as a front man for the business? Are you happy to get on stage and be the pitch man to, you know, do the vision thing? get on and or do you not see yourself as that kind of leader i i don't mind it I, I i am happy to do whatever is necessary to do if i am a garbage man i am a garbage man if i am a plumber i am a plumber if i am a task rabbit i am a task rabbit like the the ratio between cool work and probably shitty work that i do is probably like 70 percent shitty work <laughs> like if, if somebody needs to clog a toilet or unclog a toilet it's your job right like exactly if you need to go up on stage and like yay go whatever like that's that's your job too but like um i i think i'm basically like a stopgap for just about anything um and it seems to work okay it seems like we're we're doing pretty well so um hopefully we just continue to execute continue to just focus on every single day getting a little bit better and you should start to see some pretty decent results. Okay, let's put this into context of where you've come from. So you've been, I mean, last time we spoke was a year ago. I mean, even then that was quite new for you. And you're saying that you're constantly learning. I know yep. you say you, you profess not to know much about certain things, but I, I think you're just holding back a little bit more. And maybe obviously you're surrounded by people who are exceptionally talented as well. What do you know now into your journey that you didn't know when you were starting out? I know that's sort of opened up a whole area, playing field for you, but what are the key things that you know in business which have become apparent to you only through actually doing it and learning the hard way? So like, th there are a few things that sort of, sort of jump off in my head. The first is sort of how nonlinear everything is. Like you assume that if I invest six hours versus I invest 12 hours, if I invest 12 hours, my payoff should be better. Mm. It's not true. If you invest 30 minutes and that 30 minutes is doing a favor for the right guy that matters, that can produce like 2,000 hours of utility. Like everything is just really, really nonlinear. Anything to do with partnerships or fundraising or sales or recruiting, 
is it's not the hours that you put in. It's how those hours that you put in matter. Um, so that's been that that's been a really interesting conclusion. Um, I don't really know how to like make that a little bit more useful for anybody. Um, but d- does that sort of affect the way that you use your time now? Because as you said, like putting in 12 or 6 hours is not necessarily the same or double and you can have one conversation or one meeting which could be worth thousands of hours, right? Does that sort of change the way that you go about things like, as opposed to at yeah. the beginning? Yeah, no, it definitely does. Um, and there are certain events that I will go to or there are certain people I will open myself up to. and um, If certain people call, I will always answer. But like, it, it's far from a perfect solution. Because, like, the flip side of this is that 30 minutes that you think will be worth 2,000 hours, right. chances are it's worth zero. <laughs> uh, it, it's just the one in 100. You're effectively trying to chase these, like, one in 100 moments mm. um, and trying to set yourself up for as many one in 100 moments as you possibly can. Um, it, uh, another main area, and, I, like, I, I, I think it's, it, it, it's pretty heavy in terms of, like, my overall message is just how how much we, we all really don't know. Like fundraising is a great example of this. Hmm. There are some people who are professional fundraisers that are just incredible. They talk about the demographic shifts of the millennial populations in these poor markets and how this is poised to do something that is so much, it, it's incredible. And then the way in which they sell this, the way in which they lump this in, the way in which they earn the trust of the, the folks that are that are listening to them is just incredible. And then the way in which somebody who doesn't know what they're doing, and let's be honest, like a, a founder of a startup doesn't mm. really know what they're doing. It's just so inefficient. It's so like, oh, like maybe we should do this next or like like how do I make you close or like what what happens now? Like just having access to people who genuinely know what they're doing and asking for their advice and trying to close some of those gaps is incredibly useful. Um, one, one, one of the other like major things is it, it's just so hard. Like, go go figure. Like startups are hard, right? Like I, everybody knows and like talks and shares this, but like I, I don't think you realize how hard it is until you're actually just getting punched in the face. Um, and and that's not like proverbially punched in the face. Like sometimes you literally get punched in the face or elbowed in the face or kicked in the balls or like 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 literally like there's some very um, real things that happen that are just like pulling a boulder up a bloody mountain. Hmm. Um, Give us an example recently that you can you can share. I mean, you didn't literally get punched in the face by somebody, right? Or did you? What what kind of examples? Because just so people can relate to that, you felt maybe emotionally you got punched in the face when building the business. No, no, I mean, like literally, like punched in the face, <laughs> 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 or at least like threatened to get punched in the face, or like. Right. In the line of business? Um, in the line of business. Okay. Um, in the line of partnerships or solving a problem or like, like there are just a lot of opportunity. There are a lot of people who hate you. There are a lot of people who love you. There are a lot of like, it, it's just an amazing, How can somebody hate experience. a guy bringing happiness? How can, that, how can that, you bring smiles to, you're the, guys who delivered the flowers to the lady in the hairdresser how can somebody hate these guys there there are always ways genuinely um and despite your best intentions and despite your best efforts like you you lose just as money as you win but if you just keep moving forward yeah. um eventually you start to hopefully win a little bit more um but no like truthfully like i i really can't stress this enough like like a hundred hour work week is nothing. A hundred twenty hour work week is nothing. Like that's that's like a known quantity. Mm. It's the days where you like come home, you order a pizza and you eat a chocolate bar when you're like kinda like half crying on your bed. Those are the days that really suck. Um and then like the next day you realize, oh, that wasn't even a big problem. Now I gotta <laughs> solve the big problem. And like, yeah. like like whatever that problem is. And then, then cut to like three weeks later when you realize that problem wasn't even a big problem. <laughs> it's just a warm up. <laughs> yeah. Um, so lots of pizza and chocolate bars. Luckily, I run a lot. So that, so yeah. that, that works out pretty well. <laughs> I mean, that, it's really interesting, isn't it? Um, there is a, a very dominant narrative about what startup life is like. Typically, it's the young guys coming out of Stanford 
you know, in the shorts and sandals, you know, they walk into incubator, get funded straight away. It looks quite stress free, doesn't it? It looks like they just catch a wave and they get surrounded by the right people and everything works out. And that seems to be what people understand. I mean, rightly or wrongly, that's what people see as the startup narrative. But you're, you're painting a much, what's the word that I can use, a grittier picture of startup life. Do you, do <laughs> yes. you ever, I mean, you know, just going through that, some of the things that you talk about, Steve, do you, I know you, you, you've hit some real lows and that, I mean, it's fantastic that you share that with us because that is the story of every startup founder. And if anybody comes on this program and says it, that they didn't experience that, they're lying. So everybody has it. That's part of being an entrepreneur. Do you ever have doubts in those times that, you know, when you're eating your chocolate bar, crying into your pizza, do you ever think, why the hell did I do this? Why did the hell did I ever leave Google? I mean, does that, that cost you? No, it, it, it's mainly like the doubts are like, did I really want a Hawaiian pizza? Maybe I wanted pepperoni. Um, I, I'm kidding. Um, no, no, like leaving Google was never a doubt. I'll never go back. I'll never work for one of those companies again. I'll start businesses for the rest of my life. Like it's hard. Everybody knows it's hard. You get your ass kicked. Genuinely, just get your ass kicked. But like, I'm addicted to it, so I'll just keep on doing it. Um, addicted like, to retirement. What, what is? I, I'm, what I'm addicted do? to startups. I'm addicted to creating something. I'm addicted right. to making something happen. Hmm. Like retirement is for someone else. Like right. I, I enjoy what I do. Weekends are for someone else. I genuinely enjoy what I do. But yeah. you could have that kind of lifestyle working for a big tech company, right? I mean, they could work you into the ground. Yeah, and you're going to be working to you go into a box, right? It sounds. I mean, that's what you've chosen to do. So, yeah. what, what is it you're addicted? too because i'm really curious because you, you've given us the the picture of what the downside is it's what's the upside what is it that you can do here in the creative uh, side that you can't do in in the comfort of a, a big tech company i like i feel like everybody explores that so much that i'm actually genuinely trying to like paint a somewhat biased portrait here um like the upside is just incredible right like you get to create your own vision of how the world should be like, like, that's awesome. You get to, like, there, there is nothing stopping you from pushing a button. It is you pushing the button and lots of buttons that is the representation of your ideas on paper. And at the end of the day, does it work or not? Like, your feedback loop is incredible. Like, at, at Google or at all these other companies, how many people are on a team? How many decisions are truly owned by you? If you are the team that runs, um, like a portion of Google's algorithm, like that team can contribute like hundreds of thousands, of millions of dollars to Google's bottom line. It's really impactful. But at the end of the day, they're probably tweaking a number here or there. And they're doing like the study for six months uh, versus like just to create something where nothing existed for some silly little flower business, in my opinion, or in my case, it's just, it, it's transformational. It's incredible. It's, it's like giving birth. Um, I, I don't actually know what that's like. I, I don't have any kids myself. You're but, close um, doing this though, right? You know, you're going through the pain, the ups and the downs as well, right? And the attachment to it. So it's as close. I mean, for somebody who describes themselves as from the quant side of the world, you, you, you paint a very sort of qualitative picture of what you're doing as well. It's just fascinating that you, know, you talk about things like emotion and, you know, the highs and the lows as well, even though you say you're a numbers man. Yeah, you know that sort of personal touch as well, and, and being creative in what you're doing, you're creating that experience with people. I just think it's amazing what you, the, the journey that you're on. And I just go on. So I want to ask you for some yeah. advice for people starting out, but just don't let me cut you off. Yeah, I was just going to say, if you've ever read The Alchemist, yeah, um, quite long. Yeah, it's it, it's basically like that, right? So like, if you're doing the thing that you absolutely need to do. Like everyone pretty much gets out of your way and like the universe conspires to make it happen. Hmm. And like, like you're lifting this boulder up a hill and ultimately someone's able to cut that boulder in half for you. Um, that person's random. And then a third person's able to like push some of that boulder with you for a couple of days or a couple of weeks or just sort of shows up. Um, so like there is a lot of genuine beauty in this, but like, most of the time, there is a lot of like massacres to be to be had. So um, it, it's it's your good and bad. But 
I, I mean, for me, like, I, I, I love it. I do nothing else. Like, I have a dream job. Um, so, what are you? What are we complaining about? Like, right. let's, let's just go kick ass. Exactly. And you, you talk about the massacres, but you can't have the beauty without the massacres, so to speak. I know you. The the, the analogy you use of rolling the boulder up the hill. And you, you attract help along the way and people walk into your life to help you out and so on. But I think it's an important part of that. You, you ask for help, isn't it? And put yourself in a position where you're vulnerable. Because if, using your analogy, if somebody's come along and say, hey, you need help pushing that boulder, you say, no, 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 I know everything. I can do all this myself. That's the problem that we get into, isn't it? Because we, we fear that we look like we don't know what we're doing. But if you, like yourself, you're quite honest and open about this, then people will come and help you. And you yeah. open the door for those people to walk into your life as well, right? Absolutely. So let's talk about people starting out. I mean, people listening to your story, Steve, I'm sure will want to do at least a, a part of what you're achieving there, a better florist and, and to have that kind of impact. If I was starting out younger, less experienced, uh I was starting out in university or maybe graduating. What do I do? Do I, I mean, if I wanted to do what you're doing, would it make sense for me to go and work for a Google or a Facebook first and then start my own business or just go straight, do the computer science, computer engineering degree, go to the incubator? What, what would make sense today knowing what you know now? So we didn't actually talk about like this specific element, but I, I, my, my answer might come out of slightly left field. Um, so before this, I actually worked in consulting and I actually view consulting as a far better jump off point to startups than Google is mm. like Google is a great brand name and wonderful people and opens up many doors. But fundamentally, all all the startup is, is solving a problem and consulting gives you a structured framework to solve that problem on repeat. Um, so if you are more efficient at solving problems, that that helps more tremendously than just about anything. So I, I, I genuinely would prioritize consulting over a Google or an mm. Uber or a Facebook or any of these other like immensely wonderful firms. Um, the, the other thing to just sort of talk about is sort of situational readiness or like, do you have the right skill sets for the geography? So if you're in San Francisco or New York, these are predominantly, pr predominantly San Francisco is an engineering led culture. So if you are product engineering, Investors won't invest in you unless you have those skills and you are a great tech guy. You are a great um, insert language, insert specialty, AI, machine learning, whatever have you. Um, but out in Asia, a lot of the, a lot of the efficiency, a lot of the, the arbitrage opportunities here aren't super technical. Um, maybe it's because we're not truly on as much of the cutting edge as like, I, Obviously, China is incredibly cutting edge, um, and like the valley is still pretty decent. But um, like, I, I I'm almost discounting the engineering background in um, in Asia in favor of the more business background because a lot of this just requires like hustling to get through certain government regulations or finding the right partnerships to open the doors or making sure the right person partners with you instead of just building a more beautiful solution. Um, a lot of these problems get solved through like ugly dragging things through the mud through um, creating instead of like creating an algorithm. Um, I, I, I guess that, that that's sort of the advice I have. Yeah, that's really good. I mean, it's fascinating as well. So consulting would be a great vantage point because from from your background, you get bankroll to talk to and see a lot of companies and you know that would be your education you're learning about how all these companies work is that sort of the benefit that you think is what makes consulting be better over one of these fantastic it companies because they probably deal with outside companies a lot less and more focused internally on their own challenges yeah or like like the job you do like in consulting um my job is should we buy this company well should we buy this company it has to be okay what's the market like look like what's the competitive environment what are the chances that this company will look the way in a few years? Will this be an attractive investment? How's the industry trending? What are what are the risks to look out for? What are the threats? What are the opportunities? And being able to synthesize all that data in a measurable and actionable way helps you make a better decision. So now in starting a flower business, which market should I expand into is the exact same question. 
Should I expand into the really big market that's super competitive, or should I expand into the small market that's less competitive? Like it, it's the same exact question versus at Google, if you build something, that's incredible. But like the building something is not answering that specific question. Mm. Um, or uh, a, a problem I solved at Google is how do we reorg ourselves around a certain sort of concept or idea? Um, that that helps pretty tremendously. But like the things that you wrap into that are like it, it, the level of scale to solve that problem at a Google and the level of scale to solve that problem at like a 10 person company. It, it, it's almost like you're solving problems from like a different universe. Um, so for, for me, a lot of the, the lessons I learned from Google are less directly applicable. Um, and a lot of the lessons I learned from consulting are probably a lot more directly applicable just because the job you do is so much more similar to the job you do in consulting. Um, versus the job you do in Google is very, very much Google specific. Mm. And a lot of the skills are maybe a lot of the same problems exist in Google or Uber or Facebook or other sort of large scale companies, but they're, they're, they're not necessarily the same problems you face in a startup. That's great advice. That's Steve Finer, everybody, CEO of A Better Florist. It's been really, uh, well, it's refreshing as well to hear your story, Steve, because I know, as you said, the, the whole, you know, what's the great thing about starting a startup thing has been talked about a lot many times. People talk less about the, you know, what goes with the territory and you've been very candid with your, your story as well. So I appreciate you coming on and sharing that with us. Um, so before you go, Steve, help us out. I'm sure listeners want to find out more about you. Where do we go and find out more about you and your story and your product? I think if you just Google me, there's, there's some hopefully like decent things that, that pop up. I'm, I'm competing against Stephen K. Feiner, who's a professor at Columbia. Uh, and my mom is in New York, so I'm trying to outrank him. So yes, please Google me. Um, and then well, you should out, out you should outrank him. Come on, you should know the algorithm better than this guy. <laughs> I, I, I find that hard to believe. I'm pretty <laughs> sure he's he's way smarter. Uh, but um, no, just just reach out. Like my my email, is Steve at a betterflorist.com. If I can help in any other way, I'm, I'm more than happy to help. And um, we're all just here to to help and support each other. And, um, like my my company is a better florist. If if you think you can help me, just please, because shit, I need it. <laughs> Um, and if I can help you in any other way, like, please let, let me know. You've been listening to Asia Tech Podcast. Find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com.